afternoon, everyone. I'm Julian, and this is my lovely wife, Sue. And in the absence of Andrew and Alan, uh, we'll be we will be leading the service today, along with Ron at the piano and Jada at the controls. <laughs> Anything may happen. <laughs> I'll begin by greeting you all and anyone watching on the screen, and by congratulating Jada on becoming our youth representative in the diocese. Shall we thank her? <laughs> Are there any announcements that should be given? Actually, yes. There was one thing I'd just like folks to know that uh, Sandy broke her ankle oh. and uh, it has impacted their ability to get around. Oh. So she's, uh, Andrew says she's healing as best she can, but she's, it, it was a serious enough break that she's going to have to get some special meds to be able to bring it home. <coughs> so I think including her in your thoughts and prayers will be perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Now today, you're going to need your grade booklet and you can open that at page 28. I'll let you do that. And you're going to need your hymn book, and that's going to be open at four, hymn number 486. So I'll let you do that as well. And then you're going to need that little leaflet, and that's going to be open at page two. And that will come and go, and then you can put it away. Okay, so that's page two. And then you're going to need your BAS, which is the green one. And that needs to be open at 882, or Psalm 121. Okay, take your time, folks. Um, Psalm 121, it's on page 882. Okay, let's just relax about these things. Because it's awful to find them, isn't it? Okay. So today is the second Sunday in Lent. And it's almost two weeks ago that we enjoyed our pancake supper on Shrove Tuesday. And that was followed by a simple and very spiritual service on Ash Wednesday, led by Alan. On Shrove Tuesday, Ruth brought Pam with her, who's your daughter, Pam, uh, Ruth. Your daughter, Pam? Granddaughter. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you did. <laughs> and she asked, what was the meaning of the word shrove? And I didn't know. So I went away and I did a little bit of exploration and I discovered a little bit more about Lent. And so if you're sitting comfortably, then I'll give you a little history lesson for today. So the first reference to a season of Lent was written by Irenaeus in the middle of the first century. He wrote a letter to the Pope discussing the number of the days that the season occupied before Easter. And in that letter, he says, the practice of Lent began, quote, in the time of our forefathers. So it's possible that the practice of Lent was actually uh, from the very early days, possibly even before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So it's one of the oldest Christian customs. And the idea of Lent at that time 
was to prepare for Easter through self-examination. It was meant to be a mirror of the time that Jesus spent being tempted in the wilderness, which Mark's Gospel reports as being 40 days. Now, it wasn't a unified practice. Very little in the early church was unified. But by the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, so that's 320 years after Jesus, it had become one of the defining parts of the Christian calendar. And as a time of self-examination, it also became a time of prayer and fasting, again mirroring Jesus' experience in the wilderness. And over the centuries, little rules and regulations crept in and certain foods were not allowed, including flour, eggs and milk. And so began a practice of eating up all those disallowed foods on the day before Lent began. And as the food was made into little cakes and was cooked on a pan, voila, we have pancakes. <laughs> and after the pancakes were eaten, it was time for penance, a time to say sorry. In French, that is shrive shrive, to ask the priest for God's forgiveness and to obtain absolution. So the word shrive became Anglico Anglicanized as shrove, and thus on the day before Lent begins, whilst other Christian traditions developed carnivals and Mardi Gras, Tuesday fat, Mardi Gras, they developed those kind of uh, dance uh, experiences because they like to dress up. And we Anglicans have Shrove Tuesday because we like to eat. <laughs> and on the following day, to emphasize repentance and, and echo the Old Testament idea of sackcloth and ashes, we have the first day of Lent and we call it Ash Wednesday, and it's always 46 days before Easter Sunday. And we burn last year's palm crosses and smudge our foreheads with the ash. So that's why, if you came to Alan's service, we had the little ash mark put on our forehead. And evidently, Alan had spent the morning burning his last year's crosses so that we could do that. Okay. So observing Lent thus links us to the Christians throughout the world, both in the present and in the past. The readings for Lent are carefully chosen, and we will be reminded today of how a promise made 4,000 years ago to an insignificant tribe led by Abraham and recorded in the book of Genesis becomes a promise everywhere today in the writings of Paul and John. So, our history lesson is over. We can now open our grey booklets and turn to page 28 where we'll find the service of the word. Now you may stand if you wish, or you may remain seated, whichever you wish. So page 28, the service of the word, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. And also with you. We thank you, O God, that you have again brought us together on the Lord's Day to praise you for your goodness and to ask for your blessing. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that is past and your purpose in the week to come. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Dear friends in Christ, as we turn our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God, let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful God, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us turn to each other and pass the peace in the name of Christ. Now, last Friday, two days ago, three days ago, the 3rd of March, the Anglican Church remembered John and Charles Wesley, the 18th century priests and hymn writers. So it's fitting that we sing Charles Wesley's very personal hymn, hymn number 486, Love Divine or Love's Excelling, which was inspired by a verse in 1 John. God is love, and he that dwelleth in God, dwell, dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God, and God in him. 4, 8, 6.
uh, the colic um, on page two of your leaflet. Holy God, whose spirit spread amongst our response, transform the lifetime of our seeking into a welcoming home for us and for all the world through Jesus Christ, in whom we are born and new. Amen. Please be seated. Now, we're going to hear four passages from Scripture today, and we can see a thread through them that is pertinent to our hearts in Lent. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 12. It's one of the most important passages in the Hebrew Scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. Although we cannot authenticate the event described, it places Abraham at the center of a covenant with God. Abraham's descendants, especially those of the Jewish faith, looked and look today at this passage as evidence of their special relationship with God. Sue will read to us Genesis chapter 12. A reading from the book of Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the gathering. Now this passage is celebrated by the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. God made a covenant with Abraham that made his descendants special. But there are three ideas that suit our purposes today as we consider this passage in the second Sunday of Lent. First, this is a very personal God who promises to share in the life of Abraham. It's a one-on-one -on -one encounter, God and Abraham, no one else. Second, there are no caveats in this promise. All Abraham has to do is to leave his present home and relocate to the new home that God has pr promised. Third, the final verse, so important to Paul and to John, whose writings we will hear, says, all peoples on earth will be blessed by you. That's all peoples, everyone, all inclusive, no exclusions. And that is vital to our understanding of today's lessons. Now we're going to sing, sing hymn number 468 to Abraham and Sarah. It's a sincere little poem written by a United Church pastor's wife. Her name was Judith Fetter in 1984. It's a poem of faith and there's a subtle change in the meaning of the phrase you will be my people, from verse 2 to verse 3, which fits in nicely with our theme today. So hymn 468.
Please be seated. I'm going to ask you now to turn to Psalm 121, which I think is 882, page 882. It's in the BAS, page 882, and we're going to read it together. But first, I'm going to give you some background to it. Much has happened, much has happened to the descendants of Abraham by the time this psalm was written. Simplistically, we can say that Abraham's son with Hagar, Ishmael, has established what we traditionally think of as the Arab race, while his son with Sarah, Isaac, has established the Jewish race. We've passed from the patriarchs to the journey into Egypt, to the Exodus, and to Moses, and the second covenant, and the giving of the law. We've passed David, and the establishment of Jerusalem as the Jewish capital, and we've passed Solomon, and the building of the first temple. And despite the, build, uh, despite the warnings from the prophets, we've seen the Jewish nation break into two. The northern part going into Assyrian exile, and the southern part going into Babyloni Babylonian exile. The first temple has been destroyed. Around this time, very significantly, We've seen also the gathering of oral and written traditions into the Hebrew scriptures, or as we know them, the Old Testament. By the 5th century BC, Judaism was a very distinct way of life, bounded by rule, ritual, and regulation that maintained a Jewish identity separate from all other cultures in the area. Observance of the Torah, which is the first five books of our Old Testament, kept the Jewish people apart. Now Psalm 121 is a psalm of faith. It is familiar to us. It's a psalm that was recited and sung in the rebuilt temple after the return from the Babylonian exile about 1,500 years after Abraham and about 500 years before Jesus. And as we recite it together, we will feel the confidence that the re-established Jews felt back in their own land and significantly in their own temple with the full power and authority of the organized priesthood enjoying an established liturgical year of feasts and festivals. Now in the first two verses, although we don't see the word temple, they're talking about the temple. It's built on a hill, the Temple Mount, with the wailing wall that we see on our televisions every day. Jewish belief was that God lived in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. He is the creator who made heaven and earth. The temple is where God unites heaven and earth, and the temple safeguards the Torah and keeping the Torah is essential to keeping the covenant. Let's read Psalm 121 together. <coughs> I lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence is my help to come. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Be present, merciful God, and protect us in times of danger, so that we who are wearied by the changes and the chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we've just read a poem, a psalm, that is 2,500 <coughs> years old. That's older than Shakespeare. Isn't it remarkable that the disciples read this poem, that Paul read this poem, that Jesus read this poem? They called them psalms because they were actually sung with harps. The Jewish people were immersed in the Psalms. They were immersed in the stories of the patriarchs and the promise made to Abraham. They were immersed in the Torah, immersed in the temple. Judaism was not a religion to be picked up and put down on the Sabbath. It was a way of life, a way of being. Temple and Torah were central to the identity of each Jew. For some, particularly those on the fringe of society, Judaism had become very legalistic, too legalistic. It had lost the essential spirituality of the relationship of God and man. Jesus pointed this out a thousand times challenging what had become blind obedience to ritualistic law. How many times did he say, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And when was it that he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath? And do you remember the time that he said, eating certain foods didn't make you unclean, but thinking certain thoughts did. Jesus looked beyond the law to create his relationship with God. His was a deeply personal relationship like that of Abraham. And Jesus wanted us to recreate our relationship with God as a spiritual relationship. To emphasize this, I'm going to break the Gospel reading into two and ask Sue to read the first part of it. This is John chapter 3. Please stay seated. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader amongst the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know that you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts that you do, if God weren't in on it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you are not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this 
original creation sorry submits to this original creation the wind hovering over the water creation the invisible moving the visible a baptism into a new life it is not possible to enter the king god's kingdom when you look at a baby it's just that a body that you can look at and touch but the person who takes shape within it formed by something that you cannot see and cannot touch the spirit and it becomes a living spirit so don't be surprised when i tell you that you have to be born from above out of this world so to speak you know well enough how the wind blows this way and that you hear it rustling through the trees but you have no idea where it comes from or where it is heading next and that's the way it is with everyone born from above by the wind of god the spirit of god nicodemus asked what do you mean by this how does this happen and jesus said you are a respected teacher of israel and you don't know these basics listen carefully i am speaking a sober truth to you i speak only of what i know by experience i give witness only to what i have seen with my own eyes there is nothing second-hand here, no hearsay. Yet, instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face, and you don't believe me, then what use is there in telling you about things that you can't see, the things of God? So to Nicodemus, to the disciples, to anyone who had ears to hear, Jesus emphasized the personal, spiritual relationship that each of us can have with God. But the, church, the Jewish church as a whole was not ready to change. And into this scene stepped Saul, the Pharisee, Saul, the tent maker, the, je the zealous Jew from Tarsus, the man to whom temple and Torah were central to any relationship with God. And you'll remember how Saul persecuted the apostles, stood by as Stephen was stoned, and went off on his own mission to eliminate the little cell of Jesus' followers in the Jewish synagogue at Damascus. And then came his conversion. Not a conversion in the sense of changing religions, but a conversion in the sense that he recognized Jesus as the fulfillment of Judaism. That Jesus brought heaven and earth together. That Ju Jesus made Judaism complete. And Saul, now Paul, took on the task of enlarging what Jesus had begun, proclaiming the good news to everyone, not just the Jews. Paul wrote lots of letters to all the little Jesus gatherings that had grown up in synagogues throughout the eastern part of the Mediterranean. And Sue is now going to read to us from a letter that Paul wrote to the Jesus group in Rome. A reflection from the letter to the Christians in Rome. I, Paul, am a devoted slave of Jesus Christ on assignment, authorized as an apostle to proclaim God's words and acts. 
I write this letter to all the believers in Rome, God's friends. The sacred writings contain preliminary reports by the prophets on God's son. His descent from David roots him in history. His unique identity as son of God was shown by the spirit when Jesus was raised from the dead. Setting him apart as the Messiah, our master, through him we received both the generous gift of his life and the urgent task of passing it on to others who receive it by entering into obedient trust in Jesus. Please don't misinterpret my failure to visit you, friends. You have no idea how many times I've made plans for Rome. I've been determined to get some personal enjoyment out of God's work among you, as I have in so many other non-Jewish towns and communities. But something has always come up and prevented it. Everyone I meet, it matters little whether they're mannered or rude, smart or simple, deepens my sense of interdependence and obligation. And that's why I can't wait to get to you in Rome, preaching this wonderful good news of God. It's news that I am most proud to proclaim, this extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him, starting with Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what scripture has said all along. The person in right standing before God, by trusting him, really lives. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the gathering. So what Paul intends is to make the gospel available for all people, regardless of race, colour, creed or gender. Elsewhere, he writes, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And when the Gospel of John was written, much later than Paul's letter to the Romans, the universality of God's love for all people is cemented. Please stand if you're able for the Gospel reading. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from the presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert, so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, an eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger and telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. The Gospel of Christ. Thanks. So now we have an individual spiritual relationship 
between the Creator and each of us, the created, not dependent on race, religion, color, or gender. We are each in the position of Abraham, able to join up with God and acknowledge our independent union with the universal spirit. Let us sit and reflect on that for a moment. Now we'll sing hymn number 647, Spirit of the Living God, Move Among Us All, 647. Apostles' Creed is found on page 29. Let us confess our faith as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And Bob will now lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Open wide the window of our spirits, O Lord, and fill us full of light. Open wide the door of our hearts, that we may receive you with all our powers of adoration and love. Loving God, look with compassion on the whole human family. We pray for the people of Turkey and Syria in the aftermath of earthquakes. We pray for all those working to help with food 
housing, and medical care. God of love, comfort and strengthen the people of Ukraine in this time of war. We pray for all those who have been uprooted by war, injustice, famine, and oppression. We pray for the sick and lonely, for the hurt and the frightened, and for those who live without hope. Silently or aloud, please name those you know who need our prayers. God of hope, comfort and restore all those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Faithful God, refresh and sustain us as we reach out to others. Open our eyes that we may see the deepest needs of people around us. Move our hands that we may feed the hungry. Touch our hearts to bring warmth, warmth to the despairing. Give us courage to speak for justice. Challenge us to use our talents and abundance to build a community where all your people have enough. Loving God, challenge us and sustain us. Amen. Offertory hymn is hymn number 606, verses 1, 2, and 5. There's a wideness in God's mercy.
verses 1, 3, and 5. season, we do not say Alleluia, but just Amen. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, my friend. 